Today we're working on the shelter belt a bit more. Now, back in early spring, we put a row of alder, common alder, which, right, get the orientation right. Behind me is north, so behind the camera is south. So we've put a row of alder running three meters in from that fence line, all the way across, pretty much all the way across the bottom of the field. And then another row, this is the slight diagonal at the bottom corner, pointing north. And then another row, see there's one there, there's one there. You know, they're difficult to see this time of year, but you know, they're all here and they've done quite well. And then there's another row running up that edge. So that's northeast and northwest coming down in a diamond point. And inside that, in three meters inside, is a row of um, common alder. But that's a nitrogen fixer. Um, we've used Italian alder in a similar shelter belt and within three years they've gone up to 10 feet already so we're going to expecting something similar from these it's been a really bad drought year but they've survived they've done quite well so i think from in fact i can see another one here now so yeah that is the row that runs straight up here and you see there's a gap on the other side on the northward side of the alder now these are nitrogen fixing trees so they share that with the other trees that they grow very close to so the gap that we've left has got a few things in it already you can see there's a little pine tree, there's a currant there, there's another currant here. You know, it's fairly densely, it is more. That's uh, dog rose and there's another currant, and another currant. Um, there's, and that's uh, rowan behind me. So there's all sorts of bits and pieces, but the main core of that section is going to be planted with evergreens. Um, now, if you've seen many of our videos on the shelter belt, you know that we use Eliagnus ebingi, ebingi a lot as a, a sort of evergreen form of autumn olive, and again gives you a similar sort of yield of you know fruit and so on. Not quite as tasty apparently, but you know um, still pretty good. But uh, we're going to use some of that coming through here, but not entirely. We want to have more diversity, but still something to give us a yield. So one of the main backbone species of this section and across the bottom is going to be holly. So back in the summer, we ordered 30 of these and they've just turned up now as bare root trees. They're really strong, healthy, really pleased with them. So yeah, we're gonna put a row of them about every, I don't know, 10 to 15 feet down this side and then across the bottom and up the other side, maybe a bit further apart than that. We'll eyeball it depending on what's there already. You know, you don't want a very regimented uh, planting scheme. You want a certain amount of diversity in there. Um, and then, yeah, we'll take that across the bottom so that the alder will be the very fast growing summer cover species that will really shelter this particular corner from northern winds and also be like a great big lens pointed at the sun so that in summer it'll really, you know, trap all that warmth and be a really good productive species, a good a productive good system. Inside of that system, we've got, uh, there's all sorts of, at this end of it, shade tolerant things have gone in. So we've got Morello cherry and we've got um, juniper. Uh, what else have we got? There's a, a creeping form of Russian um, uh, comfrey that'll go through on the bottom. And later in the winter, we've got some, ch uh, not this side because there's a phone line above, so we have to watch the height. But that side will have a row of chestnuts and Antonovka apples on its own route will go in across that bottom section to start giving the overstory for this whole block of system but the first step of that is to get really good shelter in behind it and eventually this will be a chicken a, a food forest that's just for the chickens so we tend to call it the chicken forest even though yeah so far everything's this big so first things first we're gonna get the um uh, the holly in and then after that we've got 10 wild cherry which again do quite well as a sort of mid canopy level you know it's bigger than the morello because they're on dwarf and semi-dwarf rootstock but is again a potentially a really good productive species and being um, like a land race wild cultivar type uh, should give us a more reliable if not quite the quality yield uh, than most years you know it's a bit more resilient to uh, you know variances in um, uh, climate and you know year to year and we also have for underneath that and slightly in front a load of juneberry which is saskatoon so there's various types of that. We've grown that this year already and it did really well. Uh, so we've got some more of that going in here. And it's not the best eating fruit, but, you know, it's pretty good in preserves apparently. But also it's something that is, you know, should be a decent fodder crop that we can then give to the chickens because this system here should pretty much support them by the time we're done. So 
that's the inside of that system but we're mostly concentrating now on the uh, the outer skin the shelter because getting that up makes everything else much more productive and it'll be much better for the chickens you know even in winter time they'll be able to stay out here we're getting towards the time of year they need to go in now and i'd far rather they're still out here you know doing their thing until the really cold months so yeah first things first get the holly in the ground so in terms of placement here is the common alder and there's the fence line it's about three to four meters now you can see here there's a little pine tree and that should do quite well now these are going to be killed out eventually the mostly there is a nurse species and we've got a whole row of them of different species across the bottom of the field as well same thing applies after the um uh, the alder comes up and does its thing and these come in behind it they'll slowly be killed out you know as they start to choke things out and be replaced with more productive species so i don't want to put one here because it's going to be you know well this will give us protection for a good few years anyway so i'm going to come just this side of it and i think so what do we got that i can actually see there's loads that i won't so midway between the alder and the fence line was pretty much where i'm standing here I'm a little ways away from the pine tree. I think I'm going to call that pretty good. I can see an elder that came from a cutting. So that again is absolutely fine. So yeah, we're going to bring that in here. Now, we've done trees loads of different ways. Currently for planting bare root trees, we use one of these. This is a, a trenching spade. It's solid steel all the way through to the end. Solid as, brilliant. And it creates a really narrow slot. So I just cut the slot, take the tree, put it down into the slot and then just compress it around it with my boot. So it's got really good contact and we're doing them this time of year. The ground's fairly moist so there's a lot of flexibility in the soil so that fills in the gap really well. Yeah and that's actually squelching now so you can tell that works really well. So We'll go back up this row because we're going to do this row first. I'll probably miss where the elder is here. Uphill of that. Now, there we go. There's an alder there that I can just about see. And there's nothing else near me that I can see. So there's nothing massive. There's probably a few currant bushes because there's hundreds of them down here. But in terms of spacing, I'll take it a bit further. And we'll call it good here I think so I've got a current there so I'm not too close to that but I'm still pretty much midway between the alder and the fence line so yep put another one in here and we're going to do that all the way up this line until I've gone through about a third of what we got so once I've gone through about 10 of them we'll stop and I'll put the rest of them across the bottom of the field so I've planted one of the holly here now I'm getting pretty close to the spot here where I was going to plant another one and here we have a Cornelian cherry. Now we've got about 10 of these survivors I think. Um, we're going to leave that here. It probably won't stay here long term. We want to pick ones of these that do well here and fruit uh, pro you know, prolifically and do well with our conditions and they're the ones that then will transfer into the centre of the system. So I don't want to put a holly right next to it because it might outcompete it for light but a little bit of protection is no bad thing. So as I said, we're going to use quite a bit of um, Aliagnus ebingi in this shelter belt as well. So I'll probably place one of them. Here's the Cornelian cherry. I'll probably put it about here um, and then you know, leave this spot to put one of those into because that'll be done sometime this winter. Uh, that is another nitrogen fixer. So then this Cornelian cherry will have nitrogen fixing alder and it'll have a nitrogen fixing Aliagnus here. So it'll get a diversity of nitrogen and it should grow you know, more quickly as a result and it'll uh, you know, it grow faster and then we can use that particular cultivar, if it's a good fruiting cultivar, to transfer through to the centre of the system. It'll just accelerate that a little bit. So again, I'm, I'm skipping this one, even though it's not an evergreen species, just to keep our options further, you know, keep them open further in the line, further down the line. Another benefit of using these particular species is that in winter it'll give us a fairly spiky boundary between us and the outside now we moved here 2018 so only a few years ago and uh, at that time there was hardly any deer pressure locally because it's mostly farmland but the perception seems to be that in the last couple of years that's really changed 
and for the first time we actually had some deer damage uh, last winter I mean one tree you know it's not a huge problem but deer fencing is really expensive so I'd rather avoid it if we can now there's certain things you can use that are sort of natural deterrents to deer and one of them is a really thick high prickly hedge uh, that they won't eat through now holly is toxic to most things it must be fairly unpalatable i imagine not much likes to eat holly we've also got um uh blackthorn and we've got hawthorn in this row as well there's some hawthorn behind the camera and there's some blackthorn and hawthorn down the other end there and there's the odd one dotted in as well as that of course there'll be the holly and also there's as i say hundreds and hundreds of currents which will go up to two to three meters some of those and uh at least anecdotally current seems to be fairly unpalatable to deer so as long as it's good thick cover they won't come in and chew it and make holes in it uh, just accidentally by eating it uh seems to be fairly unpalatable to them so that's another good benefit is to give us really thick dense cover especially once you're talking about the multi-story aspect of it it's not like there's going to be gaps below that the deer can get through it's just a question of yeah keeping patching it up filling it in and and away we go before the deer pressure becomes so severe here that we have a problem because uh, it's a mostly agroforestry based site. Um, there's a lot of capacity for deer to come in and do some damage. Uh, and they, uh, with a high tree cover, they should start feeling you know, pretty secure in here soon. So yeah, the sooner we get on and start dealing with that potential, the better. Uh, so this is one of the first steps of that. Now another benefit of planting the holly in with the, uh, the nitrogen fixing plants is it's fairly slow growing so it should give it a bit more of a head start than otherwise um, you know because we really don't be feeding things it's just not something that we want to get into doing I'd rather things you know just happen passively and naturally so I've mentioned holly and I've mentioned the ebony that will be coming in as well between them um, but there's other species as well um, and one of those is wax myrtle we've got two different types of seed going in this year uh, we've grown it previously but last winter was so severe that they were all in tiny little pots and we lost a lot so this winter we've got them growing in much bigger containers much bigger slabs so it'll uh, give them a bit more protection from uh, real, really cold winds uh, really cold conditions um, and that'll come through now there's two types one is an overstory tree and we'll be planting that in as well but the other type is a like a monthly stemmed shrub so that should do quite well in the system too and it's a nitrogen fixer so again it's out of skin and bear in mind so far we're talking about uh, in terms of yields we've got holly which of course is you know this time of year coming up to christmas is you know a really useful saleable crop we've got um Eliagnus ebony which gives us uh, a really nice fruit we have, um, what was I just mentioned, wax myrtle that gives us one of the cleanest burning waxes on the planet. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a vegan beeswax, effectively. And this is just the shelter belt. And below that, inside it, without me talking into all the fruits and all the rest of it, but this is literally just the outer skin of the shelter belt. It's already given us, you know, what, four yields? Range chickens underneath it. We've got five and so on. Um, and we've got a lot more species to go in as well yet. Just dotted here and there. And, uh, yeah, it should be a good productive system. So we've got the fence line at the northernmost point. Then we've got holly here, is our evergreen um, uh, outer skin that will really protect the whole system. Just inside that, we've got common alder as a nitrogen fixing row. And then inside that, we've got pine trees and spruce trees in a sacrificial row that's going to be a nurse species. And then inside that, we're into the understory and the overstory, the food forest proper. So over here, that is a morello on a semi-dwarfing rootstock. And let's see what else we've got. That might have failed, that one. But there's all sorts of stuff. There's a juniper bush here, which again does really well as an understory. Now slightly higher than these, we're putting these in. This is uh, wild cherry. So we're going to put one, say, here roughly and then we'll go maybe 40 50 feet that way and put the next one in we've got 10 of these to space out across the entire section um, so it's not going to be you know a massive component but uh, it's just there for diversity's sake and yeah we'll put a row of them in as an understory to the chestnut and the apple species on their own route big huge climax canopy trees that will come through here in a row over the whole lot so 
when it comes to putting designing ecosystems designing you know permaculture gills and companion plants and so on uh, it's a good starting point is to pick a natural ecosystem as a, a, a good basis a good starting point now the trees here in Caithness were cold cut down apparently during the Neolithic it hasn't had natural tree cover since everything has been replanted since mostly you know introduced stuff uh, the nearest natural ecosystem of this type to us is the Rothamurphus forest that's about 130, 140 miles south, um, just south of Inverness there. And in there, there is a natural polyculture of a pine tree overstory, which you can see there's a whole row of them, juniper, wild cherry, and so on, uh, and currants below that, uh, like um, uh, raspberries and so on, which will be coming through eventually as well. So other than a few exotic things that are planted into it, and some of them are things that are more productive variants, like the Morello Sherry, we're pretty much emulating an entirely natural plant guild that works well in the Highlands of Scotland. So I'm a little bit further south, a little bit uphill towards the chickens than I was where I put the, um, the wild cherry in. And these species here are Siberian pea shrub. Now these eventually will be a fodder system for the chickens and there's a load of them. We must have 40, 50 of them in. So the survivors will come up and do their thing. They don't do well as an understory species. So we don't want to put anything in amongst this. It's going to be higher than maybe three, four meters. So these are perfect and seem to be doing really well. This is the Saskatoon. So basically around this whole section here uh, that will be the chicken forest, this whole area, I'm going to dot these around and uh, just let them do their thing and then we'll follow up later on with currants and so on later in the winter but uh, yeah these don't do as well from cuttings as them currants do so they're just getting dotted in